Many of you know that my Aunt Mana, who is 98 and was living alone, had a fall last week and broke her hip, while her niece lives close to her and always, is always the first one to respond uh, when there's a need for help. Now, the niece reported to us that Mana said, well, I hope the Lord just takes me home. Well, that's a testimony we would all like to bear. Because of our hope for heaven, we are just pilgrims passing through. And so often we become consumed with the desires and the challenges of this world that we forget that it's only temporary. And after 98 years, she knows she's closer every day, as we are too. Now, it didn't happen that the Lord took my aunt home. And last Saturday after surgery, uh, she recovered well and was sitting in a chair on Sunday. Um, Cheryl was with her and uh, told me that the hospital staff remarked about how she seemed as healthy as a 60-year-old. Well, I would like the same to be said of me. <laughs> but uh, Monday, my Aunt Mana was transferred to a rehab center where Cheryl and I will visit her often in hopes that we can help her to accept a transition into assisted living uh, as long as she might need it, um, especially as we prayed to minimize the stress on the niece who's close by her. My Aunt Mana provided an example of being down but not out. That's the title of today's message. And even when she was down, she witnessed to her niece, who's not a believer. Well, this morning, as we continue our study of Acts, we'll see that Paul was also down but not out. And no matter what happened to him, Paul was committed to being a witness until God took him home. Well, you know, I always like to review, so if you missed last week, you can be right with us. Last week, we continued our study uh, through chapter 13. And there, we read about how Paul and Barnabas were separated and sent to proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles. And this demonstrates the sovereignty of God in fulfilling his calling of Paul from birth. Paul writes about this in Galatians 1.15, where he says, God separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I may preach for him among the Gentiles. Well, remember, Paul was an enemy of Christ until his Damascus Road encounter. And as I've said before, we might think that we chose God, <laughs> but he chose us long before. In fact, I think it was Spurgeon who said, I know God chose me before I was born because he never would have chose me after. <laughs> we could say the same. Now, like Israel, God didn't choose us because we were better than other people, but because he wanted to demonstrate his power to his glory in our Weakness. Back to the review. Paul and Barnabas had been ministering in Antioch, which had become the center of Christian ministry after persecution and famine hit Jerusalem. Now, showing their strength as a body and their generosity of heart, the Antioch church sent a gift to relieve hunger in Jerusalem. And it was in Antioch, you remember, that believers were first called Christians. 
So from now on, Antioch would be the home base of mission outreach. Now on this, his first of three missionary journeys, Paul would travel 700 miles by land and 500 miles by sea. And this was the first time Paul would visit Galatia. In fact, he probably wrote his letter to the Galatians after this first visit is concluded before he visited them again. Now, I want to remind you of the highlights from last week. They are the declaration by Paul that by Christ, everyone who believes is justified. And the result is that the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. I encouraged you all as homework to find, to meditate on, and to recite a verse about joy that will remind you of God's gift to you and make you a witness to others. It's hard to find joy in this world, but we have the joy of the Lord if we will just open our mouths and give the reason for the hope that's within us. Give us courage, we pray, O oh God. And also, Lord, teach us by your Holy Spirit. Help us to understand the word of truth that we might be inspired to share it with others. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Like my Aunt Mana, God is not finished with us yet. He has purpose for each one of us as long as we live on earth. Now this morning, we'll cover Acts 14, which continues Paul's journey through cities in Galatia and brings him back home to Antioch with the report of all that God had done. In the opening of the door of faith to the Gentiles. Now in this chapter, we'll see that Paul was a man on the move, but not a man easily moved by persecution. And the same should be true for us as God desires for us to share the reason for the hope and joy that is within us, even in the face of rising persecution in our country, the land of the brave and the home of the free. Like Paul, we may be down, but not out. As we walk with Paul through his first missionary journey, let's picture it on the map that Ron's going to bring up for us now. Here's Antioch over here. Now, you may have a map in the back of your Bibles, which you would want to turn to as we walk through this chapter, because we'll, we'll leave Antioch and travel with Paul and Barnabas to the island of Cyprus, where they will minister at Salamis and Paphos, where they encounter uh, the sorcerer, Elamis, and then they travel up here to Perga, where John Mark deserts them for some unknown reason and goes back to Jerusalem. We don't know. We're not being hard on John Mark. It might have been because his mother was a widow and he felt a responsibility to care for her. More about John Mark later. But God did use him to write the gospel. And God did use him to accompany Paul on a future mission. So from there, Yes, from there they go up to, thank you, Ron, good deal, up to Antioch in Pisidia, not to be confused with Antioch of Syria, and down to Lystra and Derby. Now, instead of just taking the short route home, Paul and Barnabas go back the same way they came in order to teach and strengthen the churches which they had planted. <laughs> 
That's where we're going today. Ron, you can go back to the text and thank you for your help with the laser pointer. Let's start in uh, chapter 1, or chapter 14, verse 1. Now it happened in Iconium that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews and so spoke that a great multitude, both of the Jews and the Greeks, believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. Therefore they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Now, in Iconium, it says, a great multitude, both of Jews and Gentiles, believed. And God gave Paul and Barnabas signs and wonders to validate the gospel that they were preaching. Verse 4, but the multitudes of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews and part sided with the apostles. And when a violent attempt was made by both the Jews and the Gentiles with their rulers to abuse and stone them, Paul and Barnabas became aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities in Lycaonia, and to the surrounding region. And they were preaching the gospel there. It often happens that when light permeates darkness, the enemies of God stir up resistance. Just like in America today, there was no respect from unbelievers for believers to choose Christ and have freedom of religion. Now, many who are hostile to Christ have used the media and the education system to poison the minds of the people. Now, unbelievers opposed Paul and Barnabas and stirred up the crowd with lies and planned to stone them. So Paul and Barnabas, informed by the Holy Spirit, fled to Lystra and Derby in Galatia. Now, incidentally, Lystra is the home of others we're acquainted with Lois and Eunice and also Timothy, who are mentioned elsewhere in scripture. And on Paul's second missionary journey, he enlists Timothy to go on with him. Verse eight, and in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. Now, this man heard Paul speaking. Paul, observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and walked. How did Paul know that the lame man had faith to be healed? The Holy Spirit revealed it to him. Paul could see in the man's countenance that he received the gospel that Paul preached. Now, we can usually tell from someone's countenance that we're talking with whether they get it or whether they disagree or whether they just don't understand. Paul could see in the lame man's faith as it was expressed in action when he obeyed the command to stand up. Now, as we were studying this morning, this was not partial obedience. Well, let, let me have my assistants here help me up. No! <laughs> Immediately, he leaped up. He didn't just stand up, he leaped up. He didn't say, give me your hand. He leaped up by the power of God who healed him to validate the truth of the gospel that was being preached. If 
he had no faith, he might have remained sitting as he was, still lame and unresponsive. May God give us faith to so respond to his word, leaping to obey without hesitation and completely obeying instead of partially obeying. Now, the healing of the lame man begs a question about the role of faith in healing. Why was this man healed when Paul himself was not? Ah, you ever think about that? We know that Paul suffered a thorn in the flesh and prayed three times that God would remove it, but God did not. Does this mean Paul lacked faith? Certainly not. We must recognize that God is sovereign in healing. It is never faith that heals in the first place. It is the object of faith. Having faith in a rock is not going to heal. Only faith in God creates the opportunity to heal by one who is merciful in fulfilling his purpose through that healing to glorify himself. In this case, God healed the lame man who believed Paul's message to demonstrate his power to the audience. And that is God's purpose always with miracles. They validate the message his servants are delivering. Now, many of us have been healed of physical afflictions through medical means. Well, I thank God that he's given us access to those medical means. I thank God that he's given physicians insight about our particular needs. We don't take that for granted. I've testified that God has provided me healing from cancer not once, but twice, because he's not finished with me. And he must know and will empower me to give him the glory for all the days of my life, for as long as I am on this earth. So like my Aunt Mana, I would rather be home with the Lord. <laughs> but until he calls me, I purpose to be about his work. And that is the joy of my salvation. Verse 11. Now, when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in, in the Lycaonian language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in front of their city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates, intending to sacrifice to the multitudes. Now, there is no mention of a synagogue in Lystra, but there was a pagan temple. So Paul began his ministry there, preaching to the Gentiles who believed in the Greek gods of Zeus and Hermes. He'll do the same thing later on Mars Hill with the Sermon to the Unknown God. Here in Lystra, when the people saw the miracle of the lame man healed, they wanted to worship Barnabas and Paul as gods. But Barnabas and Paul quickly and emphatically corrected them. Verse 14. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and ran among the multitude, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness in that 
He did good. He gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these things, they could scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. Remember not long ago how Herod was struck down by God for accepting the worship of the people in Caesarea? What a contrast Barnabas and Paul show. They were appalled at the intent of the people to worship them, and they redirected them to worship the one true God, the God who created all things, yet condescended to make himself known to his creation and to bless them. Notice that as Paul is preaching to the Gentiles, he refers to God's witness through what we call general revelation, that is, through creation. Many previous agnostics or atheists, when they begin to study the marvels of creation, they are struck with how impossible it would be for those things to happen by accident. And there must be a God. And then they have yet to come to know him personally. Well, when God spoke to the Jews, he preached from special revelation in that his, his word. So we have general revelation and special revelation. Verse 19, when Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, and having persuaded the multitude, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. How fickle people are to exalt one minute and execute the next. It reminds me of how Jesus was praised with hosannas as he entered Jerusalem and not many days later was crucified and rejected. Since Paul was the spokesman, he was the one they stoned. Notice again a comparison with the riots that happen in American cities today. Many rioters come from outside places to stir up the local people. And here we read that it was protesters from Antioch and Iconium who came to stir up the opposition in Lystra. There is really no sense of live and let live. We would like to believe that's true, but it doesn't happen from the people who want to be liberally minded. They don't seem to accept the people with different views having a right for their own views. Now, stoning was not a punishment like flogging, but a method of execution. It was terminal. But Paul did not die from stoning, as some believe who think that this event is the third heaven experience that Paul wrote about in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm not going there, just a sidebar here. It says here that they dragged Paul out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Now, God could certainly have resurrected Paul from the dead, but I believe he healed him from blunt force trauma and unconsciousness because they left him for dead. Now, the word supposing usually means to suppose something that's not true or not certain. Further, when Paul mentions later in 2 Corinthians that he was stoned, he didn't say stoned to death. At any rate, Paul's rapid recovery was a miracle. And I'm sure he surprised the people when he walked back into the city. I mean, he didn't hightail it out of town. 
he went back into the city to shower and get his suitcase, spend the night, be refreshed, and then go on. There's no mention of any further threat against Paul. So I imagine the people kept their distance, realizing that the God who Paul preached could retaliate against them and cause stones to fall from heaven if he so choose. They'd now seen two miracles by God, the healing of the lame man and Paul's supposed resurrection. Now, after Paul came back to Lystra, he would now travel to Derby. Now, this stoning of Paul is one of many sufferings he endured for Christ. I recall these for you this morning to confirm the commitment that Paul had to serve his God, our God, no matter what the cost. He writes, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. 40 was supposed to be fatal. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, that's in Lystra. Three times I was shipwrecked. What motivated Paul to go on after continuous pressure to quit? <clears throat> if we rule our lives just by circumstances, we would say, oh, this can't be God's will. <laughs> this is too hard. <laughs> God's way is not always easy, my friends. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.11, I believed and therefore I spoke. Why did he speak? Because in 2 Corinthians 5.14, he writes, the love of Christ compels me. Friends, this should be our motivation too. If we believe, we should speak our witness to the one true God. If we know the love of Christ, we will be compelled to share it with others. Jesus told us that we would be persecuted for his sake, yet we must remember that this world is not our home. We're just a passing through, right? You know that old song? Jesus didn't promise us a trouble-free life, but he did promise to be with us and to send his Holy Spirit to comfort us. Verse 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra again and Iconium and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. So when they had appointed elders in every church, and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Now, nothing more is said about this visit to Derby, except that they made many disciples. After they'd already been there once, they made more disciples. Encouraged by their success, Paul and Barnabas are then directed by God to return to Lystra, where <laughs> He was recently stoned. This is counterintuitive, friends, but it's God who would direct them to do this. They would retrace their steps and also revisit Iconium and Antioch in Pisidia. Their purpose was twofold, to strengthen through teaching and to organize through the appointment of leadership the new churches that were established. This was important for the health and survival of these new believers. As we saw, there was already tremendous opposition to their existence. To hold a different belief was not tolerated. Remember, there were no churches or pastors until Paul came. So Paul and Barnabas strengthened them by exhorting them to stand firm in the faith 
through persecution. They also organized the churches by praying, fasting, and appointing elders. Good leadership is vital to the health and strength of a church. Now you know from teachings you've had in past times that Paul listed qualifications of elders and deacons in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. Remember that deacons were also appointed in Acts 6, and now elders are appointed as overseers. And the difference in the qualifications is that elders are able to teach and provide spiritual direction to ensure sound doctrine and protection against this false teaching that was continually attacking them. Now, no doubt, since these were new believers, Paul discipled some Jewish believers who already had some knowledge of God and the scriptures. A healthy church, one that would grow and be able to resist the diseases of false teaching, would have good leadership and sound teaching. Verse 24. And after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. Now when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia. From there, they sailed to Antioch in Syria, where they had originally been commended to the grace of God for the work which they now completed. Nothing well, after visiting Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, Paul and Barnabas came back through the province of Pamphylia to Perga and Italia, where they also strengthened the church by the preaching of the word. And from Italia, they sailed home to Antioch in Syria, where they reported what great things God had done, especially causing Gentiles to believe. Now it says, Paul stayed in Antioch a long time. Now for Paul, a man on the move, a long time was a year. And then God would send him out again on a second missionary journey, which they will undertake after attending a Jerusalem council meeting, which we'll read about next week in chapter 15. So we finish in verse 27. Now, when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. So they stayed there a long time with the disciples, a year, to do their laundry and repack for the next trip and teach continue teaching and discipling the believers in Antioch. I'll close this morning's message with five examples of being down but not out. My 98-year-old Aunt Mana was down, but she's not out. And even when she was down, she was a witness to an unbelieving niece. We don't know what impact that may have on this niece in time come. Paul was down when they stoned him in Lystra, but he was not out as God miraculously healed him and sent him right back to Lystra that night and then twice more after that. John Mark was down for some reason when he abandoned Barnabas and Paul and returned to Jerusalem. But John Mark was not out either. God restored him to minister with Barnabas and then later to write the gospel that bears his name. Jesus was down when he was crucified. But praise God, he was not out. God raised him from the dead and he continued teaching to establish his church before he ascended back to heaven. And I've 
testified to you before that some 45 years ago, I was down when I was betrayed and divorced against my will. And I withdrew into the pit of despair and depression. But God was not finished with me. He healed me of my disappointment and my brokenness and restored me to a life of purpose. Many of us have been down, but we are not out unless we give up and quit. God still has purpose for us as long as we have breath. Now, maybe you can't serve the same purpose that you once did, but God has given us all a purpose and gifts to serve that purpose. And perhaps his purpose for you has changed from serving to encouraging others to serve in the way that you once did. That has been my call in previous ministry to disciple others to carry on after me. We all have purpose and the enabling power of the Holy Spirit to fulfill that purpose and to minister to one another to edify his body, the church. As we can always do, we should pray, for we have much to pray about. As ones who believe in a God who hears, a God who loves, and a God who cares. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we do thank you this morning for fulfilling your purpose through your servants of old and the confidence that gives us that you will fulfill your purpose through us when we are fully obedient to you. Guide us by your Holy Spirit in ways that we may glorify you in whom alone we have our hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.